Okay, so here we go with our first lecture, lecture uh, chapter 9, which is examination and treatment areas. So the outcomes that we're going to be looking at for this particular chapter will be kind of looking at the layout um, and features of an actual typical exam room. They're all fairly similar. Some of the tables are a little different depending on whether or not you're dealing with a gynecologic or physical exam. Uh, versus maybe a pediatric table. So the tables will vary a little bit, but the actual features and the way things are set up um, are fairly um, kind of synonymous throughout throughout um, the exam room. So we'll kind of talk about the typical layout. Um, we'll also differentiate between sanitation, disinfection, and sterilization. And these are three very important uh, concepts. Um, you'll be getting this primarily in infection control. So there is a couple of pages in this chapter dealing with sanitation and disinfection, but you're going to get the bulk of this in your infection control. But it is important for this aspect in this chapter to at least go through the few pages that are in here, understand the differences between each three, and know which instruments have to be sanitized, which have to be disinfected, and which ones actually have to go through the full sterilization. Um, we'll also talk about some of the steps to prevent the spread of infection in exam and treatment rooms. Same thing. A lot of this will be dealt with in infection control, but we are going to touch on it and some of the chemicals that you can use to actually disinfect a room and what you have to do to go through that process. Um, also involved with the rooms are importance of temperature, lighting, and ventilation in the exam room. Um, and so we'll kind of discuss this briefly, um, as well as kind of introduce instruments and supplies that are used during a general physical exam. Um, how to arrange them and how to prepare them. We'll kind of deal with this a little bit later as well, too, when we actually get to Chapter 38 and talk about how to assist with a physical exam. Uh, but we're going to at least kind of start touching on the instruments here as well, just to kind of begin the identification process. Okay, so we actually look at the care and the maintenance of an exam room. Uh, we'll kind of look at some of the equipment um, that are here. Um, the supplies, as well as infection control practices, okay? Um, and so it's important to know which instruments need to go through which process. Um, let's see where we're at. The exam room itself, um, like I said, is set up fairly, um, fairly synonymously and kind of fairly balanced through most clinical sites. Um, generally, most physicians are going to work out of two rooms. Um, that The idea of that is to make sure that as the physician has one room to see the patient, that the other room can either be discharging a patient or putting a patient in so that you can maintain the flow. So primarily, it's used to accommodate the physician, the patient, and then one assistant. Okay. Um, all the supplies, you kind of, it kind of depends on your specialty area too, but the supplies and equipment have to be arranged in a way that it's easily to reach. Some places will actually put labels on the drawers and put labels on the, on the cabinets so you know where everything is. Um, oftentimes a, a clinician, especially if they're male with a female uh, patient, will have a female assistant in the room and they will expect you to be handing things to them. And so we will go through what's on a typical tray, what's uh, typical for a physical exam, and, and what instruments are used depending on what you're dealing with. So we will go through that a little bit, okay? So furnishings, um, obviously everything needs to be arranged in a way that's um, efficient. Um, you also wanna have patient comfort level and physician convenience. Generally, you're not going to have a lot of the uh, tables set up for gynecologic um, exams. You're not going to want them facing the door. You're going to have the, the, the table is going to be arranged in a way that it's not that a that the table is facing away from the door to make sure that if a patient's in a compromised position um, that you wouldn't actually be um, showing anything of the patient. A lot of times the rooms will actually have a curtain that can be drawn as well to maintain privacy, okay? Um, generally also with um, an exam table, especially the pediatric ones, you'll actually have a small step. The, the normal routine physical exam or gynecologic tables have a step on the lowest portion in the front part where you can pull out. There's usually a number of uh, three or four drawers that are labeled with different uh, 
things that might be needed, some of the consumable supplies may be there. Um, and then oftentimes you can adjust the top portion, the back too. We'll go through positioning later on as well with the beds. Um, so things that you look at, there's usually a rolling stool. The rolling stool is supposed to be for the clinician and not for the patients. Um, some rooms will have a scale, but not always. A lot of times they'll have a separate room set up to do vital signs. So some will have a scale, but not all of them will. Um, they should have um, an extra chair for any um, for any of the patient's uh, relatives or friends that might actually um, accompany the patient there. Usually there's only one stool. Trying to, trying to have more than one person in the room can be difficult because a lot of the rooms aren't big enough. You're usually going to have a straight weight waste basket with some form of a lid um, and then a biohazard container, which is red. And once again, you'll learn about all of that as far as what goes in the biohazard container. Uh, but every room will have both of those because there are some things you cannot put um, in the regular waste basket. Okay. Um, there's usually a puncture proof container for sharps. Those are usually mounted on the wall. Um, there are some that can. We will use uh, portable ones that you carry during phlebotomy, but it's a situation where most of them are are placed on the wall. Um, there's wall brackets with certain things on there. The blood pressure cuff, the otoscope, the ophthalmoscope are usually mounted on the wall. And there's usually some form of a high intensity lamp to use in case a, um, a rash needs to be checked out or perhaps a procedure is being done and more light is needed, um, as well as possibly a gynecologic exam where you need, assist, you need add light, added light to be able to see what you're doing. Now, um, in 1990, they had uh, an act called uh, the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so this particular act is designed to um, have certain guidelines set up so that every room can accommodate someone that's in a wheelchair or has a, or has a walk or some sort of assisted um, walking devices so that um, the rooms actually can accommodate that. And so the hallway needs to be um, a certain diameter so that a wheelchair can do a 360. The doors have to be wide enough um, so that a wheelchair can fit through. Um, and so these guidelines are listed on page 177 and they just kind of go through and establish um, architectural um, boundaries that need to be a, that need to be abided by and guidelines to follow so that um, anyone that's in a wheelchair or in a walker has, has accessibility. And so accessibility is an important word because it refers to um, the ease with which people can move in and out of a space. And so it's important that everyone be able to enter into the clinic or hospital setting and be able to get into a room with ease. So like I said, page 177 just kind of goes through the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and kind of sets up uh, architectural or constructural um, guidelines that need to be followed as far as the room size, um, hallway size, door, doorway size, so that that can be accommodated. Okay, so now we'll kind of look at sanitation and disinfection. Now it's important to realize that there's a three-step process when we're actually looking at cleaning instruments or some instruments. So the first um, step and actually going through and cleaning an instrument is sanitation. Okay, so sanitation is actually um, the first step in the process of sterilization. However, um, it can be the only step for some of our um, larger instruments like blood pressure cuffs, the ophthalmoscope and the otoscope, uh, reflex hammer, stethoscope. Um, there are certain things that only require the first stage, which is sanitation, and that's for just cleaning items that only touch healthy intact skin, okay? So there are some that only require sanitation, but there are some that require the full uh, sanitation, disinfection, as well as sterilization, okay? So it's important, this is, this is also listed on page 177, um, and it kind of goes through and gives the different instruments and the process of what sanitation is. When sanitation is the first step in sterilization, you're actually scrubbing the instruments and equipment with special brushes and detergent to remove any kind of blood or mucus or any other contaminants um, that might be there. But it's also the first step where you actually just take some sort of a bleach solution um, or alcohol solution and basically sanitize the 
the certain equipment that only touches healthy intact skin. Okay. <clears throat> so if you are um, going to be using sanitation in as the first step to sterilization, then you do have scrub items, um, a small brush, a neutral pH detergent, and it's a dry scrub. Okay. Um, if you're going to be using it as a way to basically just um, do the one-time step for our for our uh, our equipment that's um, larger, then you can just use um, you know a Clorox wipe or, or some sort of a bleach solution, and there's usually a time frame on it. You don't have to clean every blood pressure cuff um, every single time it touches someone, but generally this equipment will be um, will be some sort of guidelines wherever you're at as far as what you should be, how, you know, how often you should be cleaning those instruments. Okay, a lot of these are located, you know, the blood pressure cuff and the ophthalmoscope are located on the wall, and so there's usually a certain time frame for when you have to do that. Okay, um, there is something called ultrasonic cleaning as well. There's a little page that talks about that. Not all places use that. It's kind of rare. It's usually for very uh, delicate instruments or those that have small hinges and moving parts. And it's actually where you have sound waves um, that are generated through a cleaning solution to loosen the contaminants. So um, not too many places use that, but it's something that you might actually run across. Okay. Then when we look at the second phase, looking at disinfection, um, there's another set of instruments where sanitation is the first step and then disinfection is the second step. Some instruments only need to go to the disinfection stage, okay? Um, for others, it may be the second step prior to actually going through the full sterilization process, okay? Anytime you have visible contamination with blood or body fluids, it is gonna be important or the potential for that, it's going to be important that that particular piece of equipment has actually gone through the sterilization process. Okay, so anytime um, that you have to clean, there are certain things that um, require just the disinfectant, um, and those cleaning products um, will depend on where you're at. A lot of them will use some sort of a 10% um, bleach solution is a very common um, disinfectant that can be used um, to disinfect the table, uh, counter surfaces, um, and so it's really going to kind of depend on where you're at. Um, you can use a topical 70% alcohol as well, and this, the, the page that lists this table, table 9-1, is listed on page 179. It just kind of goes through the different kinds of solutions and the description of what they're used for, what the advantages and disadvantages are. And so it's important just to kind of go through and kind of take a look at that um, because it does depend on where you're at, whether you're in a hospital or a clinic. Okay, so it's important um, as we go through and prepare the exam room and the treatment area, it really is important. It's going to be your responsibility to make sure, make sure everything is clean and well organized. You can't wait for someone else to do it. Okay, you can't go, well, I didn't make that mess. I didn't drop that piece of paper, so I'm not going to pick it up. It's really important that you, as a healthcare, you know, provider, um, go the extra mile to make sure that wherever you're at, it's kept clean and neat and tidy. Because if it's left a mess, then that's going to be the first impression that a patient sees. So how you treat the patient and how well the exam room is organized and cleaned is going to set um, the precedent for what the clinic appearance looks like. Okay. Um, hand hygiene is huge, and once again, you're going to learn quite a bit about this and in infection control. Um, you're always going to want to wash your hands before and after contact with a patient, before and after any kind of procedure. If you touch anything that's contaminated with blood um, or body solution or fluids, and if you have to leave the room for any reason, you always remove your gloves, um, leave, come back in wash your hands and re-put on a new pair of gloves, okay? You're always going to want to make sure you follow the guidelines for disinfecting all work surfaces, um, tables, um, trays, and counters are going to want to be done according to the facility's guidelines, okay? 